Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast. My name is Dr. Brian Reed, and I'm a naturopathic doctor. And today I am joined by my colleague and good friend, Dr. Rochelle Wilcox. Dr. Wilcox is a fellow naturopathic doctor, and we've been working together for the last 10 years or so. Um, Rochelle, uh, while she uh, doesn't specialize in complex chronic illness per se, um, she's treated a number of patients over the years with uh, Lyme, chronic infections, mold illness, mast cell activation syndrome, heavy metal accumulation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and she also does a lot of um, mind, body, mental, emotional level work with her patients as well. Um, she works with a number of different therapies that I don't work with a whole lot of in practice. And I thought she'd be the perfect guest to have on the podcast because I think she will bring a unique perspective because she's familiar with the wild, wacky world of complex chronic illness, um, but isn't, um, you know, sort of... Uh, heavily, heavily steeped in it and works with other uh, therapies as well. And I'm just really curious to pick her brain and see, you know, what kind of support she can bring to folks who are suffering from uh, conditions that have complex chronic illness. But of course, um, folks who are getting well, um, you know, as, as they're progressing along uh, their their path towards wellness, um, you know, putting the symptoms and uh, causes of complex chronic illness behind them um, as they start to kind of phase into being more like sort of typical patients, not complex chronic illness patients, then of course, some of the therapies and interventions and things like that, that might apply to, you know, say there's the general patient population can become, you know, more applicable and relevant to them as well. So I think that there'll be, you know, a little something for everyone in this chat is uh, my suspicion. And then also just from a completely selfish perspective, I just never get to chat with Dr. Wilcox as much as I'd like to. We're both really busy. We've been working at the same clinic for a long time, but there's very few spare minutes to, uh, you know, to chat and whatnot, because we're just seeing patients or rushing off to get home to our kids or other, um, you know, uh, commitments or whatnot. So um, I'm going to pause the recording here for just a second, and I'll be back in just, mo what, just one moment with Dr. Wilcox. All right, everyone. So I'm now joined by Dr. Wilcox. Uh, Dr. Wilcox, thanks so much for joining me today. It's really great to have a chance to chat with you. Always. <laughs> I was saying in the intro, we like never have enough time to chat, you know, we, at, you know we've been working together. I was saying for about 10 years, does that sound about right? Um, and just the number of times we've, you know, had lunch together or spent time for more than like five seconds in the hallway saying hi, like it's probably can count that on about two hands over the 10 years because we're just so busy running around all the time. But um it's a little bit sad, but yeah, it's true. It's, it's a little <laughs> sad, um, but we do see each other sometimes, you know outside of work and stuff so it's like at, at our chris our belated christmas party um last night so that was anyways we, we we still you know we still connect from time to time anyways it's nice to be able to chat with you um would you mind uh just sharing with listeners uh, just a little bit about yourself uh, maybe why you got involved with naturopathic medicine in the first place um uh, maybe kind of what the nature of your practice is like and maybe just touching a little bit on um what your uh, experience has been like or what kind of conditions you've treated that kind of fall into that realm of complex chronic illness please yeah, for sure. Um, I originally, whenever somebody asked me this question, how I got into naturopathic medicine, I'm like, hmm, it kind of starts with a little bit of a heavy story. I was um, 20 and my brother actually got testicular cancer. And so I was living in Europe at the time and really kind of just dug in. I was going to the library. I was there for fun and travel. And I ended up just spending all my time in the library researching and being like, what can I do for him? and ended up coming home and did uh i had i graduated from saint mary's with uh international development studies so totally not like science related at all not thinking you know that i would go down this medical route at all and then you know lo and behold my brother gets sick it just totally shifts my trajectory and i ended up studying uh, nutrition and then I just, I realized with that, I was like, okay, this is great. And this is obviously extremely valuable uh, and the foundation of, of most things, but it, it wasn't enough. It just felt like, okay, like what else is there? Uh, and my brother, by the way, is, is great and healthy and lovely now. Um, but it really sort of sent me down this trajectory of uh, medicine and health and what it meant to be healthy. Uh, so when I eventually wound up uh, in naturopathic medicine school, I thought, okay, this, this is great because this is nutrition and so much more. Um, in fourth year, I did my uh, specialty shift in cancer. So when I first started practicing, I really kind of focused on cancer. And I did that for about 
three years and it was really rather heavy. <laughs> so I sort of changed, I, you know, expanded my practice uh, and yeah, shifted away from that a lot. And um, so now in terms of what I see, uh, who we see at the clinic, you know, I, I think it's been, I've been practicing now for about 13 years, I think. 13 years, 14 years, I'm in my 14th year. And just that trajectory, you know, I didn't, initially it was like, okay, I'm doing this out of this drive, you know, to help my brother and people like this and, and, and really watching the, it unfold over, you know, this decade of seeing, okay, that's happening. And then seeing, okay, you're treating a lot of stress, digestive issues, sleep, like just a general practice is what I have. Um, but also looking at how, people are coming in more and more it feels that more and more people are coming in with this stress of just lifestyle and how everything is imp like impacting that on every level and it just feels like it's um more and more that's happening or just maybe my awareness to that is just greater over the years and seeing it's like okay at first you know with naturopathic medicine we have a lot of tools to help with stress whether it's from an illness or from a loved one you know being sick or an accident or you know whatever the stress is in your life um and then my practice sort of expanded that's where i sort of got into the emo mental emotional because just you know could see that herbs were extremely helpful and lifestyle changes were very helpful um, but what else could we, you know, do to to really make change uh, for people in their lives and in their health? And so it's it's really kind of changed over the years. And it's actually been beautiful, really, to look back and see, OK, like how the, you know, medicine looking at it from this individual perspective. And now really the last couple of years, it's been more um, I, I mean, I want to say global it's been global but it's also been more like community oriented and um, exploring that part of medicine is really something over the last few years that's really fueled me uh, and still really fuels me it's, it's a big passion in terms of you know starting to do group work and things like that uh, to really bring in more people to support our health uh, and our vitality so I don't, I'm not sure if I answered your question really but that's yeah those are all good very useful yeah. words to string together dr yeah. wilcox and yeah it, it definitely touched on what i was gunning for there so thank you for sharing that mm -hmm. um and it's such a you know it's it's a great thing to say just for or a great point to bring up for just you know anyone for their general health like you know around the stress aspects of things or i know we <clears throat> were chatting the other day um about uh you know how the if there's just a lot of you know stressful burdens on a person's nervous system like their ability to regulate their basic you know autonomic nervous system function is going to be compromised if there's too much stress or there's not enough stress uh, sort of coping mechanisms or whatnot and that can have an impact that does have an impact on anybody's health but <clears throat> so many of my guests who you know are just 100 like specializing in complex chronic illness they I'd say a majority of them now are just, you know, at some point in our conversation mentioning like, yeah, the, you know, um, working on the patient's nervous system is so important, like whether that's amygdala retraining or, um, as you know, and some listeners know, like I'm now kind of obsessed with um, brain mapping and neurofeedback and like several of my guests have been talking about how that's been really crucially important or, um, you know, somatic experiencing, or maybe we'll talk a little bit about family constellation therapy. I think I had one patient who talked about family constellation therapy, but you'll, you'll be like the most uh, targeted person talking about that maybe if you're okay to go there you're a big big part of what you do um and so <clears throat> excuse me i think that um you know it's just a really relevant topic for anyone but you know especially majority of folks listening are going to be uh, listening because they are suffering from complex chronic illness or maybe have a loved one who are suffering from complex chronic illness so it's just a really relevant thing to uh, mention so i guess on that note since we're kind of going down that pathway um, i'd like to talk to you or ask you about family constellation therapy and other things that you find outside of the well maybe we can talk about you know supplements and herbs and things like that um, as well as non-supplemental interventions that you found to be helpful for nervous system support um, just before i ask you about that uh, dr wilcox i'll just quickly mention that as per usual uh, nothing that is said during any of these interviews, including this one, is in, uh, intended as medical advice. It's for informa excuse me, informational purposes only. And if anyone listening needs medical advice, please talk to your healthcare provider to get that advice. Um, so, Rochelle, could you uh, riff on, you know, what kind of things do you do to support the uh, patient's nervous system, please? Mm -hmm. Yes, Ooh, so many things. Um, 
so from uh, you mentioned family constellation therapy which i i can chat about first um that's been something that uh, i've been doing for the past four years now uh doing one-on-one -on -one with people and then also group work um family constellation therapy is something that originated in germany it's been around for a long time and it's a way of I think when it comes to, you know, whether it's complex chronic illness, you know, stress, whatever in our life with the demand, the load that we're carrying, family constellation work is a way of looking at you're not just isolated. And I think just really fully embodying that somatically and knowing, okay, like I'm actually not alone. You know, constellation work is a way of, um, uh, bringing your awareness to where you've come from and your ancestors and a lot of what we carry and who we are, you know, is from our ancestors. A common study that, uh, you know, many, many people may know of is the studies that they've done on rats and mice um, where they've rung a bell and then they uh, shock the rat. And so they've done that numerous times. And then after a while, they'll just ring the bell and the rat will act as if it's shocked um, without shocking it. And then they bred those rats. And then the previous two generations, I believe, afterwards, um, they never once shocked them, but they would ring the bell and they would act as if they had been shocked so you know just this uh, this uh, idea that you know we really do carry so much weight uh of our ancestors and so um the with family constellation work it's a way of really bringing that in and honing that into our body that we know that we're coming from our ancestors and that it allows I've seen a lot of, of people that do this work, uh, whether, again, one-on-one -on -one or group work, I've seen a lot of people that do it, uh, a very, like, a very big shift in their nervous system during, you know, usually during the uh, workshop. And uh, it really provides, when you're doing it in a group setting, you're actually, it's, it's very unique because you're actually looking at something that's happening in front of you. And the, the, the piece about this work that I love so much is that it really allows for you to have a different perception. And, you know, when you can switch your perception or your reality a bit to your history, maybe to a relationship with your mom or your father, um, you know, a lot of people example, for an example, I had a, um, a woman that came in with chronic pain, um, really, really bad right shoulder pain, but just all through her body. And she had tried all these different things. Um, and so she came and she wanted to do this work. And so we did a constellation on that and uh, she didn't know her father or her father's side of the family at all. And what ended up showing up was that this pain was from her father's father. Uh, and it really like shifted a lot of things for her. She didn't even really bring her awareness to her father, like her grandfather that she never knew. So even just that, realizing there's a whole half of her, 50% of her that she hasn't even really explored. And when we started to explore that, her pain started to lessen over time. And it was a really beautiful example um, and many examples of, of that we, um, with constellation work, you know, you can do it for relationships, you can also do it for, you know, illnesses. And so I've been doing it for illnesses and, and seeing shifts in people that um, when they're realizing sometimes we're actually carrying pain, uh, which sounds like a funny thing, carrying pain from your grandfather or your father, uh, you know, okay, that seems kind of silly, but, you know, there really is this blind um, love uh, that also kind of comes through with these, um, with our family. And we can have these kind of entanglements that are there that once you are aware of it, really all that work is doing is bringing awareness to it. And that awareness allows for that perception change, um, which often like click something in people. It's like, oh, aha, you have that aha moment. And then, you know, life changes. The, the, you know, there's a shift there that um, really changes for people. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, that's one thing that I, I absolutely love and um, have just been digging my heels more and more into. I'm just fascinated by that work. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a couple of follow-up questions for you on all of that. Um, so just as you're talking at the end there about the family constellation therapy, I know that uh, from my understanding of family constellation therapy, it's it's 
you know, not lumped into the same category as say, you know, trauma informed therapy, but, um, based on what you just said, it sounds like there's maybe some significant overlap there. Um, and I'm just wondering if you've thought about it from that perspective, or if you could just speak to like, um, do you see any overlaps there at all with, uh, trauma informed therapy and family constellation therapy? Definitely. I think, you know, uh, just to, there's a lot of facilitators out there that are doing family constellations. Uh, it's also known as systemic constellations in, in many, in a variety of ways. And sometimes it ends up just being, you know, sitting there with a, uh, a client that you don't even end up doing a constellation. You just end up talking and almost like somatic experiencing and just kind of witnessing and allowing some awareness to happen. And sometimes that's all that happens. Um, very much so. So somatic, somatic work, somatic experiencing, trauma informed, it's all uh, very much a part of it. I think with constellation work, it's one of the things that I love about it is that it's so flexible and dynamic and there's, there's no boundaries as to where you can go with it. Um, yeah. So sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes I'll just be sitting there and the conversation will come out and the client will just have, you know, when we're, when we're doing the work, we're, we're slowing down the nervous system um, immediately. And so when you're, as soon as you do that, for a lot of people that aren't used to doing that, it can just, you know, already click in things for people and people can just start emoting, you know, within a minute of realizing something or, or, or talking about something in a group in front of people, right? <clears throat> it takes a, you know, a certain amount of courage and vulnerability to be able to do that. Um, and just that, the witnessing, I think is very uh, healing for people. That makes sense. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> where I have some experience with family constellation therapy, like I've done a little bit of one-on-one -on -one work with other patients, my own patients over time, I've been part of a couple of constellations at uh, Dr. Klinghart uh, workshops many years ago with, uh, with my wife and I, we went and it was great. Um, but in my experience, you know, much more limited experience than your experience with it. But um, I, I would, if I was to characterize sort of the family constellation experience, um, I would say that it's, uh, it's definitely like it can be it's very very profound um and there can be like elements that are kind of like acutely like for short periods of time intense but generally like i i kind of feel like it has almost like this um, almost paradoxical kind of gentleness to it in a way where like it's just kind of a very like um it just has like a certain flow to it where it's just this like natural unfolding of releasing of emotions or integrating certain things. And um, so, yeah, kind of this yeah interesting juxtaposition of like incredibly profound, sometimes intense um, in the moment, but it's not like, oh my gosh, like I had my family constellation therapy session and like my world was just kind of like rattled for the next, like, you know, three to six weeks afterwards. Um, and I'm wondering if you've had similar experience or how, how you'd characterize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Well, it's interesting. There's a facilitator down in San Diego who describes uh, constellation work as in just sort of this pyramid and constellation work falls like a bit um, higher on. It's almost like if you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, you need to have your survival needs met first before you start, you know, expanding into other realms. And um, she created this uh, pyramid, Emily Waymeyer is her name, and um, she created this pyramid where somatic experiencing and working in the body is actually um, very important and almost key to do at least a little bit of that um, before you really drop into some of the family constellation work. And I've, I've been, you know, resonating with that and thinking about that a little bit more, where it is very soft. And the, the piece about that is that yeah it's very very slow so there's lots of like time to integrate while you're doing it you know it's um definitely the slowest therapy i've ever and somatic experiencing is very similar um just it's just very gentle very slow um so there's lots of times to integrate and to feel the motions and to let things move through you um 
However, also thinking about what she said, you know, I think uh, what I've been doing uh, now a lot with people is when people are coming in for the workshop, I'm, I'm screening them a little bit to see if they've had therapy before, if they're able to be in their body, you know, if there's a lot of trauma and somebody's associated um, and then they're going to come to this. I've, you know, had some people say, oh, yeah, like it's 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 a lot. Um, and so I've been screening people a bit more now with, with the constellation. Um, just for that like every and the people that it's a lot for um, still really benefit for it and love it and often come back um, it's uh, but there is that piece that I really and, and that's actually why I'm doing somatic experiencing with people actually in office now um, because that's actually helping to prep people before they come and do you know a big day and also um, I'm creating a six-week program right now uh, that will, that's going to just offer a little mini, like a, a general constellations about an hour. Um, and these, the program is just going to offer like little mini 10, 15 minute constellations and somatic work and little exercises to get people's feet wet, um, and get people, you know, familiar with that, um, before jumping in for a full day. Yeah. Okay. And, and just for folks who might not be familiar with somatic experiencing, could you just, you know, give us like a, you know, um, elevator pitch on like what that's, what that's all about? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, soma meaning body in Latin. So, so body in body, um, uh, somatic experiencing again is it's, it's really everything is tuned into your body. Everything that you say, as soon as you, you know, you can think a thought and a somatic experiencing therapist is going to bring you to how that feels in your body. Where do you feel that in your body? Describe how you feel that. Um, and this type of work, because our body doesn't lie uh, and it holds on to so much as we know pain suffering trauma um this type of work really gets us you know because we're outside we're all we're often so in our mind so when we start to really tune in to our body um and we start to realize like oh actually every time i think this thought i feel it in my stomach um, every time I think this, you know, um, my right shoulder actually starts hurting. Um, and so, you know, it's it's a way of um, really tuning in to like, like very, very slow um, tuning in and the therapist will kind of always just bring you back to, okay, yeah, how does that feel on your body and exploring that sensation. So with this work, when you start somatic experiencing is in body, but it's also um, a lot of times people, when you're doing that work, they'll start seeing visions and colors. And so the therapist will guide them to, you know, what they're feeling, what they're emoting, um, and really just kind of going down this exploration of, of right brain, um, you know, look at, you know, how they're feeling in their body. So this could be an example, even with somatic uh, experiencing with somebody with chronic illness, you know, if you're mentioning Lyme, even just like saying it, like, like I have Lyme and then what, what are you feeling in your body when that happens? And, and then exploring oftentimes what happens is that will just lead in a whole cascade of other sensations and emotions and things that get brought up that can also just vary in my experience of it. And in the short time I've been, um, I'm just, I'm into my second year of somatic experiencing, uh, in my short time of doing it, it's just like, it's just blows me away. Cause every time I do it, I'm like, Oh, I all of a sudden have a vision or an insight or just more depth to whatever the topic was that I was bringing up. Um, and for both, um, the family constellation therapy and somatic experiencing you, um, if I remember correctly, you said, you use the word slow to describe both of those processes and, um, my, I don't know, one part of my brain, I'm going to say my left brain is kind of like, ah, like we need results fast. You know, people are suffering. We need to like get them feeling better. Like it split. Um, and while, and, and, and then, so part of me is wondering if you could expand on slow in that, like, well, how, how long are we taking here? Like, um, is this like really slow, slow, or is it more like, no, no, it's like slow and gentle, but like, and, and that it's not super intense. Um, and then, uh, actually, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it there. So yeah. Could you speak to the, the slowness, um, side of things? Yeah, in fact, I think part of it is just it's, you know, it's when that that nervous system gets so um, tight and twisted. And so when you start to do this kind of work, 
it's, you know, to unravel it, if you do it too quickly, um, a lot of times what happens is the person can't fully integrate that. So what you want to do is to be able to integrate it, not only like mentally and emotionally, but somatically. So when you're doing it, slowness, and I also think another word is just like quiet. So there's a lot of often silence that just allows the person to kind of dive in, in terms of like, um, you know, looking at how many times you would do something. I mean, you can have a significant shift in like an hour, right? Uh, working with um, a therapist or doing a constellation. Um, so in terms of that, it's it's quite quick, but the there's a, a quietness and, a, and an allowing of, of an unfoldment of the nervous system. And so for somebody's nervous system, that's like really wound tight and, you know, they're, you know, there's always multiple factors as to why that is, um, but some people have more factors than others. And so with that unfoldment comes this, um, this slowness that you're allowing, like as one piece moves and there's an aha, you want to allow enough time, whether that's like just even a minute of watching the body and the nervous system regulate, you're really looking at this <clears throat> window of tolerance. And depending on, you know, when our nervous system goes outside of that window of tolerance, um, we're not going to be, we kind of, that's when we dissociate and we're not able to like fully ground that in our being. Um, so if we, if we stay in the window of tolerance, some people have a large window of tolerance and some people don't. And so in terms of how long, you know, you do these therapies for, um, I mean, it can take time, right? Cause you're kind of trying to increase that window of tolerance and it does increase over time so that the person can tolerate more and more stress, especially people with chronic illness, because they've already have that factor there. And, um, oftentimes their window of tolerances are, are very small. So if I'm paraphrasing well, or sort of extrapolating from that well, so like it's, it's slow um, in that, you know, it's kind of moving um, at whatever pace the patient's nervous system will keep it there. Maybe there's other non-physical levels um, as well there, but say, you know, it's kind of keeping pace with what the patient's nervous system can tolerate. And so that might go faster for some, you know, slower for some, depending on what's happening. Um, as far is that, is that fair to summarize it that way? Um, and then just in terms of say like the number of sessions that someone might need to, um, to, uh, you know, work with, to get to the point where like, Oh, I'm, you know, noticing some change. Like, uh, is it quite common that a patient would notice some type of change? Like after, after every session, um, or would it sometimes take, you know, three or four sessions before there'd be, you know, some kind of a, an obvious shift that they're experiencing? Mm -hmm. Great question. Great question. Um, Bert Hellinger, the um, originator of family constellations work, uh, would say, and I'm saying this with a smile on my face, you only ever need one constellation. <laughs> um, you know, guy. pardon? He was a confident guy. Confident guy. Yeah. I'm definitely not Bert Hellinger, um, but there are a variety of facilitators that, you know, would say, oh, it's okay to come every month. Uh, oh, you know, you should do it and really integrate the changes and, you know, do it quarterly or once a year. And so there's, you know, after listening um, to, I, I just finished last year uh, international training. So there was about 40 facilitators from all over the world. And so really getting like an idea of how people were facilitating and like the ideas people had behind it. And I really think it's that drive of just like, okay, if somebody's, if somebody's nervous system is um, capable of handling it and there's a, a, a want or a desire to really do it, uh, then I think doing it, you know, once a month or quarterly is, is okay for that individual. In terms of how much you need, um, I, I, it, it's really hard to say. I've, I've seen people where they've done one constellation and then I've talked to them later and they're like, that changed my life. Like it changed everything. And then I have other people that, you know, uh, one person thinking of a really um, tough relationship with money and tough relationship with father. And um, we did a constellation on a relationship with her father and it really, really shifted things for her. Um, however, and it did with money too, but then a whole other thing came into play that we did one on money. And so there, so 
yeah, the, it, it really depends, but definitely I've seen that you can do like a day of constellations and have a profound shift. So it really depends on, you know, the individual, like what they want to shift and what's happening in their lives. And yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's a good, good answer. Um, kind of just uh, in where this is, you know, rapidly turning into like the family constellation episode of the podcast, which is, which is fine. You know, we're just taking it where it goes. Um, it's all good. Um, so just kind of uh, circling back to um, just the, uh, where you mentioned about um, kind of ancestral um, things that we're maybe carrying like from our ancestors or whatnot, you know, the, the rat study, it's, you know, super, super compelling inf um, information, obviously. And so just, you know, for a listener being like, it all sounds good, but like, man, like if we just come back to that, like, what's the mechanism of action here? Like, that seems like it's it's a little bit of a leap of faith to be like, yeah, we're carrying stuff for our ancestors. Like, sure, rats, you know, but rats are rats, humans are humans, you know, bells are bells, you know. Um, so I, I've heard um, uh, Dr. Klinghardt, and I'm, this is quite a long time ago that I did his family constellation, you know, seminars or whatnot, but um, I, I believe that he, you know, spun a pretty good yarn about being able to piece together some evidence um, where there's some um, sort of we we carry some of the um, uh, you know emotional traumas and things like that like actually in our DNA and that it's something that's like literally passed on it's kind of like somehow encoded in the DNA and whether that's through um, uh, you know certain uh, propensities for certain gene expressions or it's actually causing mutations or um, you know I don't know but that there he kind of linked it back to saying like there there's a plausible you know physical mechanism here through DNA transfer um, then another possible mechanism to my mind at least would be like well maybe it's you know more about that you know so you know my great great grandfather had a certain trauma and then he that caused him to act a certain way so he raised my you know great grandfather a certain way and then that impacted him and then he raised you know my grandfather a certain way and then my father and then me and then so like it's kind of passing on more through uh, you know sort of behavioral choices and changes and things like that so um sounds like there's you know some we'll say some theory out there that like maybe it's more of like a physical transmission from generation to generation or maybe it's more of a behavioral transmission from generation to generation so um is there um, a, a definite mechanism uh, that you can tell us about? Um, if not, is there another explanation beyond what I mentioned? What are your thoughts on it? Um, you could give us some insight on that, please. Uh, yes, that isn't that the question of family constellations? Isn't it? Yeah, that's that's the big question. It's like, how does this actually work? So there's a lot of different theories and. Um, yeah, uh, Klinghart does touch on that, even thinking of how, you know, our eggs are actually in that fit we come from our, we're in our grandmother's womb. And then, so it's just the, how that, whatever our grandmother faced, you know, gets passed to our mother, gets passed to us, our maternal grandmother, obviously. Um, so I, I think there definitely is on, on a larger scale, what you mentioned, I think all of that is relevant. I think behavioral patterns, um, uh, DNA shifts, like I, I do think there is, um, that all of that is part of it. Um, the one thing that gets mentioned a lot is just the morphogenic field, the fields that we live in and how that implements um, uh, so many, uh, well, everything that, that essentially it's like this information field that we're a part of. And so we have this family field. Um, so Rupert Sheldrake, uh, Sheldrake talks about that, the morphogenic field. And uh, Lynn McTaggart wrote a book called The Field build um and so really just kind of getting into you know what i have a lot of curiosity about this because doing this work i've i've always naturally been quite a skeptic and it's very funny that now here i am doing constellation work which is like pretty you know it's like how, how does this work this is pretty skeptic but there's such curiosity i have around the field because when you see what happens you know in a workshop and you you know you see how somebody responds in the same way that somebody's grandmother would or information comes in that there's no way that you know you would have known about that um it's just very mind-blowing and you know Klinghart talks about those five levels of healing the physical uh the energy the mental the intuitive the spiritual and and classifies family constellation up there in that realm of intuitive esoteric and it really it really does go there and i, I think that's one of the things for me in in terms of my practice it's like you know 
the beginning is kind of going back to other things, but, you know, working on the physical and making sure people are doing like herbs and the supplements and the exercise and breathing and nature and all of that stuff and kind of working up the line and then, uh, you know, watching and seeing, okay, if people are getting these things in, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's like, okay, if these, if these basic things are met, then can we tap into whatever this is, you know, the intuition or this other part of us that, um, I think is becoming, uh, you know, more and more popular and becoming addressed more in medicine in different ways. Um, but family constellation work is just a way of doing that. Um, and the field is something that fascinates me. It's definitely mysterious, uh, but it holds, I, I can clearly tell that it holds information. Like it's very obvious in every workshop. So whether or not, um, you know, Lynn McTaggart's work, she, uh, has some studies in there and actually it's quite a heavy book to read on the field but it's interesting um, yeah it's just there's so many different theories of it but I think the mystery and the curiosity I have is the biggest part that actually drives me to do it more it's like what is this and how is this helping people it's it's important to explore those areas that we don't can't fully explain you know as it's like you know, ibuprofen, it generally works well for headaches and aches and pains. And it's like, great, like that's been pretty well established, but that's not very exciting to like study that further. It's like, that's just been established. We know what ibuprofen does, but then something like this, like, oh, so much mystery. And yeah, somebody has got to be, you know, thinking about it, looking into this stuff. Um, I, I have not made my way through the field. I think I picked it up a couple of times. I think my wife read through it. Uh, she's much more stoic than me, um, but it is, it is a very heavy book. But for folks who are not quite ready to go out and read the field, I mean, by all means, go out and read the field. But if, if memory serves, um, there's um, like kind of uh, proposed mechanisms that would kind of start tapping into like quantum physics and, and things like that, kind of helping to explain some of these phenomena that we don't really have a, a definite explanation for. So just if folks listening are like, oh, like morphogenic field, like that sounds interesting, but like also very abstract. It's like um, there there is a kind of a uh, uh, kind of a, a science-based mechanism behind this. It's not just like um, completely just theoretical you know, more airy fairy, nothing against the airy fairy. I'm a big fan of the airy fairy, but there is like kind of a, a scientific um, mechanism that at least could plausibly explain what's going on. Um, is, is that a fair, um, very rudimentary synopsis? Definitely. Yeah. Quantum physics, I, I think does play a role, you know? Um, and I think another part to add to it is that there's just something about even group. And I kind of tapped on it earlier Um but there's, um, I think it's Francis Weller who uh, talks about how grief and suffering and trauma and pain need to be witnessed, need to be seen, need to be heard. And so on some level, you know, I think there's so many mechanisms of this work. And it's actually why I even prefer doing group over one on one, um, because just the witnessing of something, people seeing, you know, what you're holding, I think just even that is just something that is um, a big driving force in, in change and in healing. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, actually, it's a great segue into another question I had for you here about the family constellation therapy. So um, you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, so to my understanding, family constellation therapy could be done, obviously, in a group setting, uh, which is perhaps preferred. Um, then you can do one-on-one -on -one family constellation therapy. I'm assuming you can do like online or distance family constellation therapy, I suppose, with video technology or even over the phone um, is is that true and are there other ways of doing family constellation therapy outside of group one-on-one -on -one in person or uh or virtually uh hmm. i think you tapped on all of them yeah yeah virtually in office one-on-one -on -one and with a group that's i mean you can also learn to do it yourself so but yes right, that's right. Fine. yeah <laughs> Yeah, fringe benefit of doing all the training you've done. It's like, oh, I can just constellate <laughs> myself, you know, whenever. Uh, well, you know, I actually teach people that in, in office, little exercises they can do at home um, to help kind of get into their body and, and connect with whether it's ancestors, whether, whether it's with their illness, um, you know, whatever it is. And even that can provide some profound insight for them. Great.
Um, well, I, know, I know we don't have a ton of time left, Dr. Wilcox. Um, I would like to ask you about a couple of non-family constellation things just to keep it a little bit novel. Um, that being said, though, where this has officially turned into the family constellation therapy episode, are there any um, additional things you'd like to mention about family constellation therapy or we've, we've covered uh, some of the major points? I think we've covered the major points, yes. I could talk about it forever, but we'll leave it there. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thanks for all the insight on that. Um, I guess just circling back to things that can be done to help support the nervous system, um, maybe just swinging the pendulum in the opposite direction, you know, like in terms of um, uh, therapeutic interventions, like say supplements or medications or say non, you know, mental, emotional, mind, body techniques. Uh, what are what are some other things that you find to be helpful for supporting nervous system regulation? Yeah, I gravitate a lot to herbs. Um, <clears throat> adaptogenic herbs, um, herbs that are just going to help the um, nervous system regulate better. Um, I think of it more as, you know, you have kind of two types of uh, your adaptogenic herbs, th those herbs that are filling your gas tank to give you the energy to do what you need to do to survive your day, how, however busy it is. And then you um, also have these herbs that are calming. They're also known as like alpha sympatholytic, um, these herbs that are just calming the nervous system. And so oftentimes the two combined or one or the other, depending on the state of somebody's nervous system uh, and where they're at, um, I will yeah use a combination of herbs for them. Uh, in terms of, Actually, so, sorry, Dr. Wilcox, just before you go on, um, would you mind just, um, just naming some of those herbs? Like we won't get into dosages or anything like that because we're not giving medical advice, but, um, would yeah. you mind just giving some examples of some of your favorites, please? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, the one of the most popular I've been, you know, the past like two years, I think, you know, patients often come in and they're on like there there's like a general sort of maintenance that people are often on it's like you know like probiotic vitamin d omega fish oil like the typical ones um and then often lately i'm finding people are just coming in and they're already on ashwagandha which is such a lovely herb um and so but that is one herb that i do love to uh prescribe because it's um just one that can really really help drive your sleep to go a lot deeper and then just also during the day just to help sustain like endurance and stamina and that type of thing um so i love that herb i use rhodiola a fair bit um more if i can say more for people to have yeah vitality and energy i find that one's a really really good one to sort of fill the gas tank to allow you to drive further during the day um i use siberian ginseng a lot milky oat seed uh shisandra um, and sometimes, you know, d depending on the alpha sympatholytics, the, you know, the calming ones, um, it really depends on the case, but I also love using essential oils as, uh, you know, a mix that you can ingest as well. Uh, lavender and bergamot, um, petite grains, another one, um, lemons, another one to use. So just, yeah, different combinations that, um, will help kind of just relax the nervous system. They're not the full answer, but they're, you know, part of the picture that can help somebody to uh, just support their vitality. And, and maybe on that note, uh, Dr. Wilcox, where, um, you know, as you said, uh, sorry, I'm paraphrasing here, but like, you know, it's not, you know, the answer or not like, you know, the be all, not, not everything they need, but it can kind of support them along the way. So um, generally speaking, uh, would you see those types of you know, adaptogenic herbs or alpha sympatholytic herbs, you know, helping a person, like say if they're, um, you know, really stressed, they're, you know, really tired because they're, you know, presumably they're, you know, just running in high sympathetic mode and they're just, just kind of burning through their energy stores, their adrenals are, you know, really been through the ringer and whatnot. So they're feeling like, you know, pretty stressed, pretty tired, pretty burnt out, maybe brain foggy. Um, would you generally see those adaptogenic herbs or alpha sympatholytics, you know, helping someone, you know, um, if say their symptoms are 10 out of 10, we're trying to get them down to like one or zero out of 10. Would you see them, you know, those um, herbs, you know, dropping someone by like, you know, one or two points on that scale, four or five points on that scale? Like, um, how supportive do you find that they can be? Um, bearing in mind that, you know, we probably do need to get to the root cause, whether it's more work-life balance, or they need to start exercising, or need to do some stress management, or need to do some family constellation therapy. But uh, how, how helpful do you find those herbal um, uh, interventions to be? 
Right. I'm going to give you an answer that um, is pretty typical, I think, for naturopathic medicine. <clears throat> it depends. Um, um, <laughs> but yeah, so it depends. But definitely, um, I, you know, it's it's actually interesting because there's been I actually had a patient yesterday where this was the case. This is an example of something that's um, happened quite a few times. Um, but yeah, over the holidays, they ended up not doing um uh part of the protocol that we had prescribed and they only did the adaptogenic herbs and they had come, come in for chronic pain and i wasn't really giving them the, those herbs for pain uh and then they came back in and they were like oh actually like my pain's a lot better and and i was like oh and they ended up not t taking anything else and i was like that's very interesting and obviously variables of seeing family and being off and things like that over the holidays also impacted with there's usually more stress around the holidays too for people um, but, you know, I do, I can see adaptogenic herbs helping people depending on the case. Um, you know, so it's, it's not everything I've seen it probably 75% in some cases, in some cases, 5%, you know, um, again, I think it really depends on, uh, a lot of compounding factors, but sometimes it can be that piece that, you know, is not you know we weren't addressing at first because we were addressing inflammation or whatever all you know all these other factors and then it's like well let's add this in and see and it can just be a make or break for for some people yeah yeah it's been my experience too like yeah some people it's magic and some it's you know barely makes a dent and like i, I would say on average like maybe like a 20 to 30 percent you know support if they're not doing other stuff like for the patients where they're <clears throat> doing all the other things but like life's just kind of busy because they've got you know too many kids and too many patients and I don't know anybody like that but you know that extra like adaptogenic support can be like oh yeah that that took me from like being 70 80 percent good to like you know 90 to 100 percent good and so like it just yeah it depends on the setting of course but th thank you for sharing those numbers um just where again we don't have a ton of time left but I'd still like to pick your brain a little bit more um are there any non-herbal supplemental interventions that you find to be helpful for nervous system regulation hmm uh, you know, if somebody, what I've been doing a lot the last number of years, which is kind of in one way, um, the opposite of family constellations, I actually do uh, procaine injections. Um, and I find, I mean, while well, procaine does help regulate the nervous system, it takes you out of that fight or flight state. Um, and for my patients that are just very much like a lot of kids, really stressed, chronic illness, whatever it is, um, we'll add on some injections during our, our appointment time. Um, and it's, it's, it's been, you know, if you're going to ask me the question of like, does, how helpful is that for my patients that it's, um, where they're really, they've got a heavy load in all aspects of their life. Um, it's something that does help to keep them floating, if you will, above the water. Um, and I would probably say that um, it's it would add another 25 to 30% uh, of a benefit. Um, yeah, it's and it's really, yeah, it's really, really, really helpful for calming in the moment and can often last kind of weeks at a time. You know, I, I have patients that generally when they, when they get it done, it's, you know, every couple of months sometimes or once a month or, um, yeah, but it can make a big difference in the nervous system. Other aspects like just sleeping more, right? You know, like having, whether it's herbs for sleep or magnesium, I think is our like, like most prescribed mineral ever. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, just working on the nervous system from an orthomolecular point of view. Um, even sometimes like B vitamins can be just like that. Oh yeah, of course, like so that just feeds everything. So, um, and even uh, a big piece of with the nervous system is I really focus on the liver a lot, actually, which is kind of a maybe a funny thing. I think of it in Chinese medicine, just as where that qi gets stagnated. So that was, I think, the number one uh, diagnosis when we were in school was like, oh, who has liver qi stagnation? <clears throat> and 
you know, it was, and you see, I see that a lot in patients. And if we can, if you can get that flow moving, if a liver, think of it like liver cheese stagnation is just like congestion of the liver. If you can really get that moving, people often have a lot more mental clarity. It really helps with brain fog. Um, it really helps like balance hormones and stress. And so it's a whole other aspect um, that really can benefit the nervous system. And when that's functioning better, just as when digestion is functioning better, um, that's going to help people drop into a deeper sleep and support their nervous system. It's almost like that core tenant of naturopathic medicine of treat the whole person is important because if there is a, I, I just look at it as, you know, what are all the burdens that are on a patient's nervous system? And to say nothing of all the mental emotional factors, it's like, oh, if there's, you know, if the person has like some mild IBS and they've got some mild eczema and they've got, you know, some recurring urinary tract infections, it's like, oh yeah, like I can deal with all that stuff, but it's just like more stuff piling on that nervous system. So if we can get the physical body as healthy as possible, then that's really good for the nervous system regulation too. Um, Dr. Wilcox, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Um, just before we wrap things up today, um, were there any uh, parting thoughts that you wanted to share? You've shared a lot, um, but I just, uh, in case you were like, oh yeah, there's one more thing that I wanted to say. Um, I feel like it's been a really good chat, but anything else uh, that you'd like to to share with listeners? Um, yeah, I think with, when, you're de when you're looking at complex chronic illness, there's, there's, you know, there's such a weight to that and all the aspects of, of your life. And, you know, touching on it, it's like, yes, like everything is there. And I think I, I can't speak for you, but I, I, you know, what I do, and I think what a lot of us do is sort of just look, you know, we're looking at the whole picture and seeing what's feasible for somebody to do right now. And, you know, family constellations, isn't something I'm going to recommend to everybody. Um, you know, just as injections is something that a lot of people will be like, what? Um, so really kind of just looking, you know, meeting somebody where they're at, um, and knowing that, you know, I think, you know, in our, in our chart, we always have future plan and it's like future plan can go on forever, really. Cause there's just so many options that are there for people, um, which is something that, that I love about our medicine. Uh, but yeah, it's just that meeting somebody where they're at and knowing that, um, there's many places that you can go. There's many levels that you can go. And, um, even just knowing that be helping to kind of triage people into, you know, the best place to start, um, is, is, um, I think really key to it all. Yeah. 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 I think that's a really important point. And yeah, one of the many things I love about the medicine we practice, you know, whether you want to call it naturopathic medicine, functional medicine, uh, integrative medicine, like just, um, you know, when we, when you look at some of the algorithms and say more of like just a conventional medical model, it's like, Oh, a patient has this symptom, you know, do this test from there, go to here, do this intervention. If that doesn't work, go here. If that doesn't work, go here. Eventually like you, the, the algorithm ends. Um, it seems like with the functional medicine algorithm, like, especially if you start getting into the higher level stuff, you know, it, it, it can never end. And, and not to say that we want to all be on endless treatment protocols. I mean, maybe you and I do because we're always experimenting on ourselves and our family members and everything to, you know, we want to see what things are like for uh, experienced treatments and, and methods so we can better explain them to our patients and all of that. But um, at the end of the day, I think it's really encouraging if a person is suffering from complex chronic illness, or maybe it's not even complex chronic illness, it's just a really, you know, persistent symptom that, you know, it's just maybe one thing, but like nobody's been able to find an answer. Um, it's really encouraging. You know, well, there are you know, so many things that we can explore because the human body is so darn complex and, you know, it's, it's nice to have those options if folks, you know, want to look for them. So I think it's a, a heartening thing to know about. Um, so, uh, Dr. Wilcox, if folks wanted to, um, work with you, I know you don't, don't have a, um, a, a social media presence as, as it stands right now. We've talked and joked about that for many moons now, and that's all good, probably better to <laughs> be on social media, but many of us have taken the bait. Um, but uh, folks wanted to work with you um, either, you know, one on one or, or uh, you know, long distance or whatnot. Um, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, the best way is to go to our clinic website, East Coast Naturopathic. Dot com. Dot com. Yeah, Doesn't yeah. know the URL because you're just not worried about promoting okay. it. That's uh, true. Wonderful. Dr. I'm just, I'm just, just teasing there. Um, so I'll include the link to our website in the show notes below. And um, yeah, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I really enjoyed it. Yes, thank you. Same. And uh, thank you to everyone who listened to this episode of the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it and please stay tuned for the next one.